okay so let's get started so you have uh, so this will be the last of the torturous lectures as part of this course and uh, the idea of what we will do today is to link up some of what we discussed in the first lecture to what has happened in the last lab and the lab that is going to uh, be done this week okay so that will be the the basic idea of conduct conduct of an experiment you've done fair bit of electronics you've gotten in introduced to a few things that uh, that you see commonly in all uh, data acquisition systems you've spoken about it you have a sensor producing analog voltage goes to an adc processed by a microcontroller maybe a dac later on okay. that's the structure of all dac systems data acquisition systems so you've gotten exposed to that you also did a couple of rounds of uh, calibration okay the basic idea of calibration uh, why is it important because all the numbers that you generate through an experiment has to do with some meaning that you derive out of those numbers and that meaning is derived prior to you conducting the experiment okay that's done through the process of calibration so you got introduced to that little bit about the notion of accuracy precision not not delving too much into it the last experiment was uh, something that we will discuss now i mean a lot of things happened during the course of that experiment which you may not have uh, had the opportunity to pay adequate attention to so we will discuss that now as well as this week's experiment okay these two things we will uh, discuss now and tie it with physics which is ultimately what experimentation is all about okay so uh, we will focus on the idea of uh, validating a hypothesis or a model and experimental procedure is important to do this uh, systematically confidently repeatably etc so in the in the first lecture uh, this slide was put up why do we need to experiment you are all going to be part of the scientific community and you need to be able to validate if a certain hypothesis that is posed to you is valid or invalid and that's the basic idea of why you need to do experiments so we will come back to that idea and how it relates to the two things that you have done in the that one you have already done one you are going to do now okay so we will discuss the beam experiment okay so you may not have been aware because of your uh, preoccupation in the actual conduct of the experiment some numbers being thrown around procedure is not clear that is not happening this this voltage is not coming out etc but there were several hypotheses that could have been validated or invalidated during the course of the experiment okay so uh, was there a hypothesis that you were aware that you were validating or invalidating so uh, those people who think they have some idea of what hypothesis or what you can come up with anything you want pertaining to the last week's experiment that you think was validated or invalidated okay one year anybody else who thinks no idea of what hypothesis was being validated okay first let me remind you what the experiment was so you had a beam so this beam was screwed at one end so basically clamped and you had strain gauges mounted at this end of the beam okay so these are the strain gauges okay so these strain gauges as the name suggests are used to measure strain of course strain meaning uh as far as you are concerned you can think of it as elongation or contraction okay so when you are bending something this part elongates okay so you take a scale and bend it on this side holding this constant you will you will see that you can imagine that the top part of the scale will elongate and the bottom part of the scale will contract okay so the strain gauge is used to measure these sort of small elongations and contractions so how does it work it works through the principle of changing resistance so 
when a strain is applied to certain uh, uh, certain materials, their resistance changes. Okay, and this is known a priori to the people who are manufacturing strain gauges, and they they have already calibrated how much the resistance changes for a certain elongation of, or contraction of the strain gauge. This has already been done by the manufacturer of the strain gauge. Okay, so those strain gauges were mounted here and were used as part of a bridge network. Okay, you know what a Wheatstone's bridge is? You must have solved these problems. So, uh, suppose you apply a voltage across this sort of a bridge network, network of resistors, you can compute the unbalanced voltage here given this voltage and the ratio of the resistances. This you must have done, it's straightforward application of your principle of charge conservation that's Kirchhoff's current law and the voltage law. Okay. So, what was done was these strain gauges were used as part of, uh, as the arms of your bridge network because of which you got an unbalanced voltage which was amplified using op amp circuitry and that was displayed uh, on your oscilloscope or you measured it using a multimeter. Okay. So, what you effectively measured here was strain that is the amount of elongation of the top surface when you put a weight here. So, you, you put a weight here. Okay, and the, because of the weight, this thing deflects. Okay, and, and that deflection really creates an elongation here, and you are able to map the elongation that you have here to the weight that you have here. So you put different amounts of weights, you saw different elongations and different voltages that you saw as the imbalance here. Is it clear? What what was done? last time around. That was the first part of the experiment. Then you, uh, so you did this for several weights and you did a plot of deflection as recorded by the strain gauge to the weight that was applied. Okay. So, this was related to the voltage through the calibration table or the other way around to the calibration table. So, you measured voltage and went to deflection using a calibration table. Is it clear everybody what what happened last time around? Okay. Then you did something interesting. I do not know how many of you uh, understood what was happening after that. Some K computation and some mass computation and some some funny things happening. Okay, so after this, what you did was you came up with a a chart where you computed a quantity indicative of stiffness. Okay, so how how that quantity got computed was that you took the weight that was applied divided by some measure of the deflection. Okay. So, that deflection was measured here using your screw gauge, right. So, the deflection was measured there. So, weight divided by deflection is Newton per meter is the units of that quantity. What does that quantity signify? Did anybody think about that? Of what? It is spring constant of what? Ah, right may be. Abhi right may. Sunye? Right may. Ah, go this Speak. Spring constant. Uh, of what? Of the beam. What do you mean spring constant of the beam? Explain what you mean by the term spring constant of the beam. Tell me, do you understand my question? Whoever has the mic now. No, sir. Okay. Do you remember what I am talking about? Yes, sir. Uh, you were there for the last experiment. 
Uh, you no. did the last experiment or not? Yes, sir. You did. Okay. So you computed a quantity k. Yeah. Hmm? Is the ratio of weight over def deflection as measured by the screw gauge? Yeah. I want you to tell me what this means. Uh, this is same as the k that we get in uh, finding out g, sir. Finding like out g equals to one by two pi times under root k by m. G. Gravity. The fundamental, uh, the nat natural frequency of the. Now what I am asking a simple question. What is this W by delta? Why was it computed? To find out k. What is k? K is nothing but the, uh, the. It under root k by m is nothing but the fundamental frequency of the material. I'm asking you what is k. Then we can go on under root k by m. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but you know under root k by m is something. Yeah. Okay. Why? You're comfortable with that? I don't know what is k, but under root k by m is something. What is k? Sir, that is spring constant for the vertical displacement of the beam. K is because, because it's been used lot of times before in the context of spring constant, you're saying spring constant. What spring? What springiness are you talking about? By the way, this is not an easy question to answer. Huh? So don't, I don't think most of you will, will get it even after we have a discussion. So the point of the discussion is for you to get thinking about it. What spring? What, well, I don't see a spring, I see some beam there. So the vertical motion of the beam uh, makes it behave as some spring, uh, the oscillations. So uh, it is same as uh, the spring constant. If we put a spring in place of it, so uh, it would be if same as the spring, spring constant. What? Your uh, line of reasoning is, is all right, but if we put a spring, how? Is my spring going to be like this? Uh, uh, and my weight sitting here and it going like this? Sir, uh, it, uh, it would be elasticity of the beam. Yeah, it is related to the elasticity of the beam, but you are talking about a vertical spring, right? Some mass and a vertical spring. Is this what you are talking about? So if we equate the frequencies, so I am guessing, uh, if we equate the frequency of the vertical oscillation of this beam. No, no, no. Before we equate the frequency, I am asking you, what does that K represent? That is elasticity of the beam, I told you. Okay, we will get two more comments. Oh, one, one guy who's put up there. And Basically, uh, the material behave different, uh, differently in different directions. So the elasticity in the vertical direction is basically what is K. Okay. Both, both these answers put together pretty reasonable, but we will we'll get some more here. So the, the main thing I want to get out here is this K is actually a human contraption, right, which can be given lots of interpretations. Okay. Inherent in this K, in the computation of this K, is a model. A model is an, something that human beings construct to describe a physical situation. Okay? Models are very important to engineering. Because we are not able to describe or understand the physical situation in totality as it exists. So what we do is that we, we solve some toy problems. Okay, and assume that those toy problems or the setting of the toy problem applies to different situations. Okay, now the, uh, what I am discussing here is is uh, philosophically very important. Don't dismiss it. It's 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 fundamental to engineering and science. Okay, so all these problems that you do in your in uh, different courses, your whatever, JE preparation, that, this, these are all toy problems. I mean, have you ever seen anything like this in your life? Spring and something hanging like this? Probably not. Very few people would have actually seen something like this. 
and some oscillation happening or some other set of pulleys and moving around here and there. Very rarely you see all of these things. Why are you doing all this? One is to clear some exam. That is, not, that is not the real answer. The real answer is that by solving these toy problems with a whole set of assumptions, assuming Newton was right, blah, 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 you come up with a certain solution of the toy problem, right? And then you assume that the same setting sort of thing applies in reality, okay? That assumption is critical. And you assume that that solution here will give you a reasonable estimate of what is happening in reality. Do you understand the process? You solve a toy problem because that's all you know how to solve. You can draw something on paper and compute something and feel very important, intelligent. Okay? Then you relate that toy problem to a physical situation. How you relate that is, is the essence of engineering. It's not the ability to solve those toy problems. Because eventually people will get to know how to solve the toy problems. But the good engineers are the ones who are able to relate some types of toy problems to some physical situations or the same sort of toy problems to a wide variety of physical situations. That's where the engineering charm is. Okay? So what you ended up doing last time, hopefully you two are representative of a reasonable number of people sitting out there, is that you assumed that this toy problem applies to the situation that you are dealing with. That is, if you solve this toy problem for some K, and that K coming out of that experiment, a vertical spring and a mass moving around, Okay, what mass are you talking about here? Uh, this guy is saying mass that is kept on it. Uh, so the mass is the mass, uh, there is some effective mass of the beam uh, that the uh, spring shell... You need to speak mass. a little louder, a little okay. unclear. Uh, there is an effective mass that of the beam as seen by the spring, which is different from the mass of the beam. Right. So uh, there is something called effective mass. Now, where did that effective mass come from? Okay. For this effective mass to be valid, you need to go through a process of, of assuming some mass and computing the mass which will give you the, through which you can say that the frequency that is measured is the same as the frequency that comes out of this, this toy problem. You understand that mass is called the effective mass. So inherent in what you did, you, you may not know what you did, which is the case for most people through their lives is the assumption that there is a model used to describe this and we are trying to equate what happens or the predictions of the model against what is, act, what is uh, actually measured. Okay? So the hypothesis that was tested was this, that a spring mass model of the, of the form that you see or we just saw, the spring mass model is useful to estimate the fundamental frequency of vibration, transverse vibration of the beam. That is the hypothesis that we tested. So suppose somebody came and told you, uh, you use the spring mass model, this, this problem you, need, you know how to solve in estimating the frequency of free vibration and you, this problem applies to the beam. Suppo suppose somebody came and told you that. How does it apply to the beam? You compute the mass of the beam, put it here as the mass of the beam and compute this quantity by measuring displacement for different values of weights you put on it and compute that K. I mean, this is a weird procedure. Do you realize it's a weird procedure? It's not something that you would just come up with. So how many people is this obvious that this is the way to get K and what, what sits here has to be the mass of the beam? I don't think too many, too many people will be comfortable saying that, okay, this K, if you compute this way and this MB, the mass of the beam given all volume and density, etc. If you stick in here and compute the free vibration frequency, you will get something close to what happens in the beam. That is the hypothesis. That is, that is not a true statement. It is it's a, a statement which you need to validate or invalidate by conducting an experiment. Okay? So do you understand what hypothesis got validated or invalidated? I think what you would have gotten is some number which is in the same ballpark as what, what was estimated, but not really the same thing. Maybe half or twice or something like that you would have got. Right? I think this was 9 hertz and that was um, 18 hertz or something, some, some such number. Okay, so 
what the mass spring model with the assumption that the k comes from this p over delta sort of thing was approximately 9 hertz I'm told and the experimentally measured thing was 18 hertz I mean you looked at the oscilloscope right but the important point is not whether to say I 9 hertz again 18 hertz again what do you do with it the point is you could estimate that this will be in the order of a few tens of hertz just by, ta by taking a piece of paper and conducting an experiment without actually making it vibrate. So that you did, were, were able to do because you had an inherent model in your brain and that model was what we, we described in the sheet of paper. Okay? So there are a lot of things that are happening in, in every experiment. If you really delve into the questions that are going behind it, you will see that it is not very easy to come up with comfortable answers that you are going to be satisfied with okay so uh, so think about it I'm not asking you to accept what I've said as these are some weird things I, just some K and some MB I mean, you can come up probably with a better model to describe it okay but nevertheless even something as simple as this seem to seem to give you some some reasonable numbers okay so that was the point of the last experiment that you can actually construct a model and predict something so these, these problems, these toy problems are not a waste. They are not there only for you to clear exams. Okay, now we are going to do a toy problem. We are going to understand this toy problem. So how many you, uh, so in your, you did physics 1, was any mechanics taught to you? Physics 1? No, only electromagnetism. Okay. Uh, so what we are going to do here is some basic Newtonian mechanics. It's not, not difficult at all. So we are going to describe the motion of this guy, this toy. So understand, the important thing to understand is this is a toy in front of you. This is not reality. Okay, you should not go away from your bachelor's program thinking that this is reality. This is, this, this is not reality. These are some, some things that you have concocted. Okay, so you draw a free body diagram of this assuming some, some extension of the spring spring is going to pull it back kx okay and that is responsible for the acceleration in a direction opposite the pulling of the spring so the acceleration ma or this is x double dot is negative kx okay so that's this equation is again a human construct newton told you this and you believe it this is not reality okay but we are not dealing with reality now we are dealing with this this space which is unreal space so you have this unreal space which is behaving like this okay free vibration when, when no external force is applied so now we tell uh, for those of you who know how to analyze linear differential equations you must have done a course in ODEs yes maths 2 one part of it was ODE, the other linear algebra, they are closely linked to each other. Okay. So, how many of you can confidently analyze the behavior of this ODE? You raise your hands nicely. Confidently analyze. So, those who are not confident, I will ask you. Do you understand the question first of all? How many of you can con confidently analyze this ODE? Analyze, you know what anal analysis is? How does this this beast behave what sort of x will satisfy this equation okay those sort of questions okay so what sort of x will satisfy this equation okay so the what sort of x will satisfy this anybody satisfy this equation we are dealing with okay same sort of equation uh, appears if you have an LC circuit, LC oscillator. Any volunteers for what sort of equation, what sort of X will satisfy this equation? Do you understand the question? What sort of X satisfies this equation means if you plug in that X and you do MX double dot plus KX, you will get zero. That is what I am asking. Uh, X equal to sin omega X satisfies or cos omega X x equal to sin omega oh 
x equal to uh, a sin omega t plus b sin b cos omega t. B cos omega t is the same as sin which is hey, you guys are like children here. Crazy fellows. Okay, so uh, this is a candidate. So the reason why this works, do you know the reason why it works or you just know that it works? Oh. In this case, acceleration is proportional to uh, x and at mean position the acceleration uh, is zero. So for simple harmonic motion, uh, the object no, no. has tendency to move towards the mean position. No, that but is why where from the object has tendency to move to the mean position, that's fine. But how do you know that the ob object moves with this sin, sin omega feature? That's the question. Why should this structure work? I can, have, I can have a motion where I always pull back with a constant force. When I'm away, I pull back with a constant force and this side I'm also pulling back with a constant force, so I come back to the mean position. But the answer to that situation will not be the same. This is your 11th standard, 12th standard through JE stuff. You're giving me all, parroting all that. I want something more than that. So I'm spending a lot of time here because it's, it's important for this experiment also. It's important that you understand this. Yeah. Sir, maybe because uh, its double differential is also sin omega t. Yeah, so the, the, the structure of the equation is the, is the important part that certain functions when double differentiated will give you the same function but scaled by a different quantity. Okay. So in this case, if you have sin omega t as your function, do a double derivative of that, you get some scaled version of sin omega t. And that seems to work, seems to fit this, this bill because mx double dot is a scaled version of x. Okay, this, that's the reason this, this works. Okay, so this sort of a function which when put through a system does not change in its character but only changes in, in its scaling is called an Eigen function. Very similar to the notion of an Eigen value. Okay, you have a matrix, you hit it with a vector, what you get out, if you get, get the same vector but scaled by a different quantity, that sort of a uh, vector is called an eigenvector. So the equivalent of the eigenvector for linear differential equations is your exponentials, but in this case it's a complex exponential. Okay, so the reason why this works is because of the specific structure of the equation. Okay, and this omega that we are talking about happens to be your root of k by m. Okay, you can convince yourself, it's not difficult to convince yourself. If you take x is a sin omega t and just plug this in, okay, so you get m a omega square sin omega t plus a sin omega t k equal to 0. So then you, you find out that omega has to be root of k by m. It cannot be any any omega, but a specific omega. Okay? So this is the reason why, uh, or this is how this toy problem behaves. In our own minds, we have created a toy problem, applied Newton to it, we have solved that differential equation, so applied some mathematics to it, interpreted it in some way, but this is all on paper. Okay? So now we stick this, stick this guy together with this root of k by m. I put this k and mb and compute this quantity root of k by m. Okay, then there is some radians per second, hertz and all, all of that. So that's, that's not important. So this quantity is computed through by assuming that this model of, of transverse vibration is valid. Okay, so that computed quantity is compared with reality. That's what you ended up doing and you found out that they were different but they were in the same ballpark. Okay, so this was what was done in the previous experiment. Okay, so what are we going to do in this experiment? We were going to obviously test another hypothesis or validate or invalidate another hypothesis. Okay, so you've, you've been exposed to this 
so many times over the, you accept it as granted okay so the hypothesis is a hypothesis that's not going to stun you okay it's a acceleration due to gravity is approximately 10 meter per second square close to the surface of the earth okay now there are a lot of things that uh, that go into making a statement like this first of all why should there be something called an acceleration due to gravity which is a constant first of all okay there is a lot of questions that you can ask but suppose you assume galileo was right newton was right etc and then you said that there is a quantity called acceleration due to gravity which makes sense close to the surface of the earth and i want to compute that quantity or i want to estimate what that quantity is the claim here is that a quantity is approximately equal to 10 meter per second square so this is the hypothesis you are going to end up testing or validating so what the, res the result of your procedure will be that yes i agree it is approximately 10 meter per second square or i disagree it's approximately 10 meters per second square because of this reasons okay so how do we test a hypothesis like this ideas are very simple but actually executing it and coming up with a number is not so simple okay so we'll just step through it so how does one validate a hypothesis like this any ideas okay so somebody here says you put a spring mass oscillator like this and then what what do you do so you get elongation how do you know spring constant yeah so frequencies and this thing will work yeah yeah so one you must have done a 11 standard experiment or it is part of your syllabus didn't do it at all some bob is moving around like this okay I'm sitting with a stopwatch long bob how many of you did this experiment actually did it don't lie how many of you actually did this experiment i'm not asking whether it was part of your physics lab or not that's a different question that's like asking how many of you did ic211 all of you right so how many of you actually did the experiment with a stopwatch okay so uh, one way to do it is with a pendulum okay so now time to find out if you understand the physics of the pendulum so here so how does one validate this hypothesis you have to actually physically construct a pendulum we are not going to ask you to physically construct it it's not that difficult but you need some elements for that also once you construct a pendulum what we are going to do is we are going to measure the time period of the pendulum for some displacement from its mean position equilibrium position let it go it keeps doing this and you measure the time period the same sort of experiment that you did in your 11th standard but done a little better okay the little better comes from measuring the time accurately so the time is going to be measured using a microcontroller that's the only conceptually you are not doing something different it's like a stopwatch but it is done better you are not waiting for it to so when you if you have ever done the experiment in the lab in the physics lab it's not very easy to find out when it actually reached zero velocity you just uh, assume ah it is take a zero velocity it has reached or when it is actually reaching the center and then there is a time lag between when you decide it has reached and when you actually press okay all that is happening so you are measuring time a little better using a microcontroller but the principle remains the same the third part of it just by measuring time so what you are measuring some time you should be able to correlate the time to this quantity called acceleration due to gravity okay that correlation requires what it requires you to construct some model on paper and understand the behavior of the model you have constructed okay so that's the reason why you need to know how to construct models and under understand the behavior of your own models okay it's not a, it's not some exam exam related stuff so if you actually want to validate this hypothesis which has been assumed to be true all the way along okay throughout your life you will assume it to be true okay so the model you will construct is this so this looks this is an easier model to construct by the way than the previous previous labs experiment 
because there is a one to one correlation between the way this looks on paper and the way actually the pendulum is going to look. Okay, so we are going to deal with something like that. This guy displaced version, another displaced version. This is how we picture a pendulum also. Okay? So this model is easier to construct from a physical point of view than the K and MB etc. we used in the last experiment. Okay, so now I am going to get a Bakra who is going to tell me the physics of this model. We can assume a small theta displacement. And oh, you said you were going to do it. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Assume small theta displacement. And then we can write down the equations. Ah, bolo, abhi equations bolo. On the box. Kya, kya equations aata hai? So there will be an mg force acting downwards. Okay. Uh, tension along the string. Spring? Along the string. String. Mm. And then we can take the components of the mg mm. perpendicular to the string and along the string. Batao, components batao. Mg, mg sin theta mm. and mg cos theta. Okay, great. So far, so good. So now the mg sin theta will be providing the torque. Will torque. be providing the torque. Torque about this point you are going yeah. to talk about. Yes, okay. sir. So Badao. mg sin theta into L will be equal to I alpha. And I is ML square. So now we'll approximate theta as theta is small. Sin theta is approximately what, theta. What is alpha? Alpha is the angular acceleration. Okay. What happens to T and mg cos theta? Pardon me, sir? How are T and mg cos theta related? So mg cos theta will be equal to T. Ah. How many of you agree? How many of you agree T will be equal to mg cos theta? Raise your hands here. Anda milega to me. You should, guys should not have cleared J.E. T will be equal to mg cosine theta only if it's not accelerating. Is it accelerating or not? Yes, sir. No, it's accelerate, centripetal acceleration. Sir, so, ah. T minus mg cos theta will be equal to mv square by r. Okay, fine. So, how many of you are happy with this equation? How many of you are happy with this equation? So, those are others I assume are either un unhappy or they don't care. Who, who is unhappy? Nobody is unhappy also. The rest don't care. So I'll don't lot of don't cares. What is alpha? Angular acceleration. Tell me what is alpha? So it's angular acceleration. You have to speak speak into the mic. Huh? It's angular acceleration. Ah, how is it related to theta? Is it related to theta? Yes or no? It is related to theta. It is related to theta? Yes. How? It's minus omega square theta. Minus omega square theta. Minus omega square theta. What omega? It's angular velocity. Kuch bhi bol, bol ra, why not omega to the 10,000 to the theta? See? Why is it omega square theta? Minus omega square theta. What do you mean by acceleration? How is acceleration related to displacement? I am not going to let you go when you, you can feel as bad as you want. How is acceleration related to displacement? Theta is your angular displacement and alpha is your angular acceleration. How is acceleration related to displacement? How is acceleration related to velocity? The rate of change of velocity. Acceleration is rate of change of velocity. Okay, so now how is acceleration related to displacement? Double derivative. How is velocity related to displacement? The rate at which... Come on. Velocity is the rate at which displacement takes place. Okay, then how is acceleration related to displacement? The double derivative of... Double derivative of displacement. What do you mean by omega square theta? I mean, you... I mean, these... You are not thinking at all. This is, this is somewhat related to double derivative. Actually, this is a symptom of what, what happens over here. Okay? 
after you clear your exam. Not very many people really understand stuff, okay, whether you like it or not. So when confronted, what you really understand, you come croppers. Just because you can solve some problems and get some marks doesn't mean anything. Okay? Okay, so how many of you are happy with this equation? This equation. This equation is correct to describe the physics of the situation. How many of you say this? How many of you don't say this? Or how many of you say it is incorrect? Any, anybody else? Anything else wrong with this? Okay, some minus sign, yeah, that, that's a bit similar to what happened in the previous case. You displace it and the acceleration which tries to restore it is in the, in the opposite direction of the displacement. Okay, so you acknowledge that by saying if the displacement is, a, is considered to be positive in certain direction, your acceleration is in the other way. Okay, you have a minus sign there. So, what is called the governing differential equation. Okay, this... Remember, this equation comes from a human construct which is a model to describe the pendulum. This is not the pendulum. This is not the pendulum. Okay? This is a model of the pendulum. And then you apply some equations making some assumptions. So the governing differential equation is this. So we are going to find a theta which solves this. Okay, for somebody mentioned for small theta, the governing differential equation behaves like this. We make the approximation that sin theta is approximately equal to theta for small theta. Okay, so if your displacements are small, then you can assume that this governing equation describes the behavior of the pendulum. That's what that's the statement we are making by making a... So this is very similar to what you saw. This is your mass. This is your spring. Okay? And if you find an A sin omega t which satisfies this, it's the same thing as the mx double dot plus kx equal to zero. It's the same equation. There is no difference at all. So what you will get is... Is that okay? So root of g by l is your frequency. Now this is a prediction. This prediction you will assume is right. You will assume that this prediction is correct and you will find the value of g such that the prediction matches reality. This is different from what you did the last time around. The last time around, you did not even assume the prediction was right. Okay? You did not assume the model was correct. Here you will assume that the model is correct and you will match what the prediction comes from the model or we will assume that what comes from the model is equal to what happens in reality, then estimate G. Okay? So this is your frequency and obviously your time period will be related to the inverse of this. And if you are talking about, so this is related to your time period. So if you are able to measure time period, okay, in reality and you assume that this model is correct, then you can get an estimate of G. Okay, so that was the third bit of what you need to do to be able to get there. You will have to assume Newtonian physics is correct in this situation. Only then you will be able to get the estimate of the parameter. Okay. Now, you don't even have to assume the Newtonian physics is correct if you can conduct, construct a lot of different pendulums. You can construct a lot of different pendulums, look at the ratios of the T1 to T2 for a lot of different pendulums and then from there you may arrive at the conclusion that there is a quantity G, which seems to remain constant. Okay, that's that's a different set of that is a different experiment, but that is not our experiment. Okay, so now we will spend some time on understanding 
how is it that you will get the time period? Okay. So you will use a microcontroller like I told you. So you will have a pendulum. It's not exactly how we spoke about. So this pendulum is going to go into the paper and out of it. Okay. You understand? So side view is going to look like this. Okay. Now we are going to put a source of light here and a detector here. Okay. So this this guy is a light source. So every time this pendulum bob obstructs the light, the detector is going to see a change. Okay, and you are going to capture the time of that change by connecting schematically. This is connected to a pin of the microcontroller. On your board, you will see the top right corner has a few bit IOs. Okay, so one of those it is going to get connected to. So obviously it is not a straight connection like this, there is some signal conditioning electronics in between. But basically every time the light source is obstructed, the voltage level of what is getting connected here is going to change from high to low. Okay, it's been designed that way. So your job is to estimate the times when it goes from high to low. So now there are some specifics. So this is not a real point mass, it, is, it has a own physical dimension. So if it is moving to your right, to your right, then you will see this edge first, okay, the obstruction will begin, okay, so you will go from high to low, then again low to high when the obstruction ends. So you will, you will see some behavior which is like this ideally. But it won't really be like this, it will be like this. Very close to the change, you will see some funny behavior. If you actually measure it in the oscilloscope. Okay? So your job is to get this T1, T2, which will tell you at what time the bob passed this way. And at the same location, you measure the time it comes back. So you will have T3 and T4. Based on this you can estimate the time period of your pendulum. Okay? If you know T1, T2, T3, T4 in seconds, you can, I am sure all of you will be able to come up with some estimate for the time period. So that's, that's pretty much what you are going to end up doing except that the job of doing that will be through the timer module of the microcontroller. So you have been exposed to the timer module struggled with it in one of the previous experiments. So the timer module, as I mentioned to you, has a counter which gets incremented at an integral d multiple of the, of the bus frequency or the clock frequency. Okay? And your job in the timer module is to understand what the, what the clock frequency is, what integral d multiple you are using for your timer counter and how many counts of that integral d multiple have elapsed that will give you an idea of time. Okay, so what you need is actually the, the difference between these two things, the difference between these two things and the difference between these two things, not the absolute versions. Okay, that's what you really need. So the timer module, uh, so two things for you to remember, so I will look at the program a little bit, I'm not going to construct the program for you. The structure of the program will look like this. Like we have already discussed, all of microcontroller programming where you are dealing with physical signals boils down to setting register values appropriately. There is nothing more to it, nothing less. So you have to understand the different modules or the different resources offered by the microcontroller, understand what registers to be set to what values. So you will use the timer module. 
Okay, you will also use serial port interface where data that you that you obtain has to be communicated somewhere and you will do something a little little different from the ideal situation so ideally some behavior like this is going to be seen but since you have some noise around here every time you see a, a change you will wait for some time before recording because the change it has a change actually happened okay because you will see noise before and after so you you will have to put in a delay small delay it should not be too large then otherwise your your estimate of time is also corrupted okay so you will have to use the serial port interface the timer module okay introduce delay every time you see voltage change on a pin so this is your algorithm pretty much you will have to worry about one more thing about overflows because the timer counter can overflow so you will have to worry about how to handle overflows okay and handle overflow so this is what your program will end up doing okay is it clear overall what the program will end up doing the program will use the timer module to get estimates of time it will introduce a delay every time there is a change so how do you know that there is a change you have to keep looking at something okay so that activity can be done in a variety of ways one way of doing it is polling keep asking have you changed have you changed have you changed have you changed okay that's the that's the activity you will use to find out if there has been a change and every time there is a change you will wait for a small period of time and then record the time as given by the timer counter keep repeating this procedure as it's going up and down taking care of overflows overflows means timer counter goes all the way and comes back okay so for you to be able to do this we will give you a, a structure of a rough structure of the program and then you can set register values and play with it so obviously there are a lot of assumptions that that go into this being correct of course you can measure time much more accurately than you do with a stopwatch but again the estimate of time period that you get will be subject to the assumptions that you have made of things working okay i mean that actually when the fall happens that is when the thing passes all those assumptions are there but the assumptions are more reasonable than your stopwatch okay so that's how you will get an estimate of your time period with that you will construct you will assume that the physics of it is the way we described it get an estimate of what the time period should be compare it with reality get estimate of g is it clear what you will end up doing the experiment itself is not very complicated it is actually a very simple experiment in the way it is constructed it's not difficult to put together a pendulum not difficult to put together a light source connected to a microcontroller etc but the philosophy of what we did is not different from any other experiment first you construct a hypothesis construct a procedure which by which you can get something about the hypothesis most of the time if you are estimating parameters like we are estimating the value of g you will have to assume some physics associated with with the situation in this case the physics comes from newton okay it may come from it may come from other guys maxwell or whoever it is and then you estimate the parameter the process remains identical so you have a measurement procedure by which you compute some number based on which you compute the value of the parameter this is how you go about estimating every parameter what the experimental procedure is what measurement systems you use how you interface it with electronic circuitry those will change from experiment to experiment but the basic idea of how to conduct the experiment remains the same okay also what you have learned in this course the basic structure of modern day data acquisition systems will also remain the same probably until another next 10 10 20 years before there is a drastic change in the technology so that is also a useful thing to carry forward okay so 
at the end of end of it all if you have a reasonable flavor for the following okay reasonable flavor for what goes into a data acquisition system okay so if you have a reasonable flavor for what a modern day data acquisition system looks like what are the elements of it adc's microcontrollers reasonable flavor of typical electronic prototyping devices multimeters oscilloscopes right some familiarity with these things this is the absolute basic necessity that the course should have taught you or the absolute basic stuff the course should have taught you on top of this if you are able to appreciate some of the ideas behind measurement systems calibration accuracy repeatability reproducibility precision and on top of this if you understand the context of performing experiments role played by experiments to validate hypothesis role played by models in the process of validating hypothesis you've been able to put all that that together then you have actually understood the flavor of the course okay so hopefully we have been able to give you a gist of all this the idea is not to make you exactly be able to measure something in a in a specific situation but give you the necessary background to ask the right questions to do that okay so that was the intent of the course if this has overall been i mean with different degrees of certainty for different people then we would have done a reasonable job of introducing this course to you if it that has not happened either we have not done a good job of your you have not got, done a good job of assimilating it or both okay so what was this course about hopefully it is reasonably clear after this uh, after this lecture if you have any questions on philosophical aspects as well as some detail for the experiment that you are going to conduct we have four or five minutes any questions you don't you don't have to feel so jittery yeah huh? you can sit here for a little while longer it's not it's not direct so the question is instead of taking the sensors output directly into the microcontroller why don't you do some signal conditioning such as noise cancelling that's already been done for you so you are not going to design that noise cancelling circuitry it's already been done uh secondly because a large part of the way the course is conducted and the way it is delivered three people sitting in in front of a you know on a workstation two people sitting on a workstation uh does not make it possible for you to differentiate between the person who's doing the experiment and not doing the experiment during the course of the experiment okay so the nsem quiz though it will not have the biggest weight across across the mark spectrum will decide your grade basically okay because that is going to differentiate who has understood something who has not understood something because more or less otherwise you have all many of you have shown up for the experiments and done something okay so the idea is not to say that oh this guy is great and that guy is is not great but the idea is for us to know how many of you have had a reasonable understanding of what has happened okay trust me you are not going to be bothered about this grade ever in your life it's going to appear a oh, very important right now but it doesn't matter okay so the spirit of the exam is for us to understand and for you to show that you have understood something and in the middle of all this you have some grade and some cgpa and all that being computed any other questions logistics okay so we are done with the course